Discover the gripping tale of how the most ruthless Narcos met their end. Uncover the thrilling account of their capture and ultimate demise as justice prevailed. Join us as we delve into the dramatic showdowns and heroic efforts that brought an end to these bloodthirsty criminals. Get ready for a story of bravery, perseverance, and the triumph of good over evil. This is the electrifying saga of how the most bloodthirsty narcos were captured and killed. Number 1. Pablo Escobar Thirty years ago in December, the world saw the end of Pablo Escobar, one of history's most infamous drug lords. Colombian authorities closed in on Escobar, resulting in a violent confrontation that led to his death on December 2, 1993, in a Medellin suburb. His story is one of power, crime, and ultimately, downfall. The story of Pablo Escobar is filled with a diverse array of characters whose lives intersect with his. Their stories have been retold in various forms of media, from books to movies to TV series. Among them are figures like Griselda Blanco, George Jung, and others, whose lives became entangled with Escobar's criminal empire. His rise to power began with small-scale crimes before he delved into the cocaine trade. He quickly ascended the ranks, accumulating immense wealth and power at a remarkably young age. However, with power came enemies, and Escobar found himself facing threats from law enforcement, rival cartels, and even vigilante groups. Despite his vast resources and tactics of intimidation, his network of loyal supporters dwindled over time. The 1980s marked a particularly violent period in the narcotics trade, characterized by the emergence of powerful cartels and the looming threat of extradition to the United States. Escobar attempted to enter politics, but his ambitions were met with suspicion and scrutiny. Eventually, mounting pressure forced him to resign, further fueling his determination to evade capture and maintain control. His reign of terror extended beyond mere drug trafficking, with bombings, executions, and even a war waged against his own country. Despite surrendering in 1991, he continued to exert influence from behind bars, orchestrating his escape from prison in 1992. His escape triggered a massive manhunt involving Colombian and international authorities, culminating in a shootout where Escobar's life was finally taken. However, the circumstances surrounding his death remain shrouded in mystery and controversy, with various theories circulating about who fired the fatal shot. In the decades since Escobar's demise, his legacy continues to captivate the public imagination, sparking ongoing debates about his life, crimes, and ultimate fate. Despite his death, the impact of his criminal empire is still felt today, serving as a cautionary tale of the dangers of unchecked power and the consequences of a life lived on the wrong side of the law. Number 2. Ramon Arellano Felix In Mexico, there was a troubling incident that unfolded in Mazatlan, a popular coastal destination. Three armed men sped through the streets, ignoring a police checkpoint, leading to a chase and a deadly shootout near a hotel. After some time, authorities uncovered a significant revelation about the incident. One of the deceased individuals turned out to be Ramon Arellano Felix, a notorious figure in the world of drug trafficking and a prominent fugitive on the FBI's most wanted list. Confirming his identity faced some obstacles because individuals claiming to be relatives swiftly retrieved the body and had it cremated. Arellano Felix, as depicted in FBI posters, had a distinct appearance with a round face and an outdated hairstyle. However, the deceased individual bore little resemblance, likely due to undergoing plastic surgery, a common tactic among drug kingpins. DNA analysis from blood samples ultimately confirmed his identity. Following this revelation, law enforcement announced the arrest of his brother, Benjamin, who managed the financial operations of their cartel. The Arellano Felix brothers, wealthier and more influential than the infamous Pablo Escobar, controlled a substantial portion of the global coke trade, supplying up to 70% of the market. Ramon, known for his audacity, 
once callously tested a new firearm by shooting a passerby from his car, confident that residents would refrain from reporting the crime out of fear. The cartel's brutal reputation for executing individuals in public spaces transformed Tijuana, a bustling border city, into one of Mexico's most violent areas. Ramon Arellano Felix personally orchestrated the execution of law enforcement officials, legal professionals, pregnant women, and even children. He enlisted wealthy young men, dubbed narco juniors, who fueled by drugs carried out particularly heinous acts of violence. In one horrific incident in 1996, gunmen brutally took the life of a state prosecutor outside his home in Tijuana, subsequently driving their van over his lifeless body. Another chilling example involved filling the body of a victim with drugs before being dressed, placed in a car seat, and transported across the border. The cartel's influence extended to corrupting officials through substantial bribes, reportedly spending millions annually on such endeavors. Over the years, several high-ranking Mexican military figures, including the head of the Army's anti-drug unit, have been implicated and imprisoned due to their ties to the cartel. Although the death of Ramon Arellano Felix and the arrest of his brother are celebrated as significant victories, Experts doubt it will significantly impact the drug trade. The Tijuana cartel, likened to a Fortune 500 company, possesses immense power, conducts operations with extreme violence, and will likely continue smuggling vast quantities of illegal substances into the United States. Will Glaspie of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration emphasized the enduring strength and danger posed by the organization. Number 3. Ellsworth Raymond. Ellsworth Raymond Bumpy Johnson, born on October 31, 1905, in Charleston, South Carolina, earned his nickname Bumpy due to an unusual protrusion on his head. At the age of 10, Johnson's family relocated to Harlem, seeking safety after his older brother became a suspect in taking the life of a white man. Despite the move to the North, racial prejudice persisted and Johnson, with his petite stature and distinctive southern accent, became a target for bullies. Yet his fiery temper prevented him from becoming a helpless victim, and he quickly learned to defend himself from a young age. Forgoing formal education, he embarked on a series of odd jobs and fell in with a dubious crowd, catching the attention of gangster William Bub Hewlett. Through Hewlett's introduction, Johnson entered the world of illegal gambling in Harlem, where he gained recognition as a dependable bodyguard. However, Johnson's illicit activities, including burglary and exploitation, eventually led to a 10-year prison sentence. Upon his release in 1932, Johnson found himself broke and without employment. It was during this tumultuous time that he crossed paths with Stephanie St. Clair, a formidable figure in Harlem's criminal underworld known as Madam Queen or queen of the policy rackets. St. Clair took Johnson under her wing. Together, Johnson and St. Clair waged war against rival crime bosses, most notably Dutch Schultz. Johnson and his crew, numbering nine, engaged in guerrilla tactics, targeting Schultz's men with relative ease due to the scarcity of white individuals in Harlem during daylight hours. Assuming the roles of St. Clair's bodyguard and chief enforcer, Johnson was responsible for numerous acts of violence, including executions and kidnapping. Despite their efforts, Schultz and his associates held sway over illegal gambling operations in Harlem, buoyed by legal protection. However, Schultz's demise in 1935, orchestrated by Lucky Luciano due to internal conflicts within the mob, shifted the balance of power. In a bid to evade law enforcement, St. Clair entrusted her operations to Johnson, who subsequently brokered a deal with Luciano. This arrangement allowed Johnson to control Harlem's rackets independently, albeit with a share of profits going to Luciano's faction, later identified as the Genovese crime family. Although feared by the community, he earned their admiration and respect, earning him comparisons to Robin Hood for his philanthropic acts such as distributing free turkeys during Thanksgiving and providing aid to the less fortunate. 
Johnson's criminal activities caught up with him in 1951 when he received a 15-year prison sentence for drug trafficking in New York. Most of his sentence was served at Alcatraz Prison, and he was released in 1963, five years before his death. Despite his advanced age and declining health, Johnson continued to attract the attention of law enforcement. In 1965, he staged a sit-in protest at a police station, refusing to leave. Although initially charged, he was eventually acquitted. Number 4. Frank Lucas Lucas grew up in LaGrange, North Carolina, near Goldsboro, with his parents Fred and Mahali. His life took a sharp turn towards crime when he witnessed his cousin's execution by the Ku Klux Klan. This traumatic event led him down a path of small crimes until he got into a fight with his former boss, resulting in theft and arson. Fearing the consequences, Lucas fled to New York City, where he got involved in petty crimes and became associated with a gangster named Bumpy Johnson. After Johnson's death, Lucas aimed to challenge the Mafia's dominance in New York. He traveled to Thailand and then to a bar frequented by black soldiers, where he met a former sergeant named Leslie Atkinson. Together, they smuggled drugs into the United States, using various methods, although Lucas's claims of hiding drugs in soldiers' coffins are disputed. Despite his exaggerations about his profits, he managed to establish a lucrative drug operation in Harlem. He trusted only close associates from North Carolina to handle his business, believing they were less likely to betray him. Lucas boasted about the purity of his goods, nicknamed Blue Magic, and claimed to have amassed significant wealth, which he used to invest in properties across the country and even a ranch in North Carolina. Lucas mingled with influential figures, but preferred to keep a low profile, dressing modestly despite his wealth. However, his criminal activities eventually caught up with him, leading to his arrest in 1975. He was convicted of drug charges, but later cooperated with authorities, resulting in numerous additional convictions. He spent several years in prison, but was released on parole in the 1980s. Despite attempts to rebuild his life, Lucas faced further legal troubles, including a conviction for attempting to exchange drugs. In his later years, he dealt with health issues, including confinement to a wheelchair due to a car accident. He passed away in 2019 at the age of 88 in Cedar Grove, New Jersey. Number 5. El Mayo Originally from Sinaloa, El Mayo began his involvement with the Juarez cartel back in the 1980s and 1990s. Following the death of the Juarez cartel's leader, Amado Carrillo Fuentes, also known as El Señor de los Cielos, El Mayo formed his own group. As the Tijuana cartel weakened, El Mayo expanded his operations into the northwestern states of Sonora and Baja California, controlling a significant portion of heroin dealing into the United States. In recent years, El Mayo faced setbacks with the arrest of several close family members, including his brother, two sons, and a nephew. Despite these losses, some of them cooperated with U.S. authorities in exchange for reduced sentences. Despite speculation about his retirement, he remained active, surviving an assassination attempt allegedly orchestrated by another Sinaloa cartel leader, Damaso Licenciado Lopez Nunez. With Licenciado's subsequent arrest, El Mayo solidified his position atop the Sinaloa cartel alongside El Chapo's sons, known as the Chapitos, though occasional clashes occurred between their factions. El Mayo's criminal network controls much of the drug trade in Mexico. They've also been implicated in money laundering schemes across Mexico, involving various companies, some with government contracts. Operating from the mountainous Golden Triangle region, spanning Sinaloa, Durango, and Chihuahua, El Mayo's influence extends into Sonora and Baja California, where associated armed factions ensure access to border crossings. They maintain connections in South America for supply and Asia for precursor chemicals needed in synthetic drug production. Their clientele spans globally. His alliances have shifted over the years, with his collaboration with the Chapitos 
being a key factor in the Sinaloa cartel's dominance. He also leveraged connections within the Mexican government to expand his influence north and south along the borders, often leaving casualties in his wake. Despite a long-standing $15 million bounty on his head by U.S. authorities, El Mayo has managed to evade capture for over four decades, utilizing his connections and local support in Sinaloa. With El Chapo out of the picture and internal strife within the cartel, El Mayo's role remains pivotal, contingent upon his health. Speculation arises that his son, Ismael Zambada Sicairos, alias El Mayito Flaco, could succeed him. El Mayo, often dubbed Mexico's last drug kingpin, has eluded capture while steering the Sinaloa cartel through decades of drug trafficking, earning him a legendary status in the criminal underworld. Number 6. Rocco Morabito Rocco Morabito, an Italian mobster once considered among the top five most dangerous fugitives, has escaped from a prison in Uruguay, according to the country's interior ministry. Morabito, nicknamed the Cocaine King of Milan, was a prominent member of the Indrangheta, a powerful organized crime group in Italy known for its drug trade in Europe. The 52-year-old fled the central prison in Montevideo, along with three other inmates, by creating a hole in the roof. They then proceeded to rob a nearby farmhouse. Morabito's association with crime began early, being related to Giuseppe Morabito, a notorious mob boss who operated in southern Italy under the Andrangheta Syndicate. Following his family's footsteps, Rocco engaged in dealing between South America and Italy. Despite being on the run for 23 years, hiding in countries like Brazil and Uruguay, Morabito was apprehended in 2017 after his daughter's enrollment in high school led to his discovery. Although arrested, he managed to escape from prison with three other inmates, only to be recaptured in Brazil in 2021. Awaiting extradition to Italy, Morabito had been living in Uruguay under a false identity for 13 years, presenting himself as a soy trader in an affluent Punta del Este neighborhood. Upon his arrest, he was found in possession of a Brazilian passport under the name Francisco Atilio Capelletto Souza, along with multiple phones, credit cards, and a firearm. Italian authorities launched a nationwide appeal for information on Morabito's whereabouts and were determined to bring him to justice. Matteo Salvini, the Italian interior minister, expressed grave concern over Morabito's escape, pledging to investigate the evasion procedures and pursue Morabito relentlessly. Morabito's criminal journey began in Calabria, Italy, where he swiftly ascended the ranks of the mafia. He gained notoriety for delivering cash to drug traffickers in Milan. Despite an attempted arrest in 1994, Morabito managed to evade capture, eventually being sentenced to 30 years in absentia. His escape is a tale of crime and evasion, prompting authorities to intensify their efforts to ensure he faces justice for his actions. Number 7. Christopher Michael Koch Christopher Michael Koch, also known as Dudas, was deeply involved in criminal activities from a young age. Born in 1969, he grew up in a family deeply entrenched in the trading of drugs. His father, Lester Koch, led the Shower Posse, a notorious drug gang operating in Jamaica. Christopher and his siblings lived a life of luxury thanks to their father's illegal profits, attending prestigious schools. Tragically, Christopher lost his sister and brother to drug-related violence in 1987 and 2004, respectively. Following in his father's footsteps, Christopher gradually became involved in the family business. When Lester Koch passed away in 1992, Christopher, at just 23 years old, assumed leadership of the Shower Posse and gained significant influence in the Tivoli Gardens community in West Kingston. Despite his criminal activities, he also initiated community programs to assist the impoverished residents of Tivoli Gardens, earning him widespread local support. Such was his influence that even the Jamaican police found it challenging to enter the neighborhood without community consent. However, Christopher's criminal activities eventually caught up with him. In 2010, he was arrested on drug charges 
and extradited to the United States, where he faced federal racketeering charges related to drug dealing and violence. His arrest triggered violent protests among his supporters in West Kingston. Initially, there was resistance to his extradition, with Jamaican Prime Minister Bruce Golding refusing to hand him over to the U.S. authorities. However, after mounting pressure, including evidence obtained through wiretapping, the Jamaican government relented and a warrant was issued for Koch's arrest. His attempt to evade arrest by disguising himself as a woman failed and he was eventually detained. Fearing for his life, he voluntarily waived his right to an extradition trial and was taken to the U.S. to face charges. In 2012, Christopher Koch was sentenced to 23 years in federal prison. Despite efforts by his defense team to portray him as a philanthropic figure, federal prosecutors presented evidence of his involvement in brutal acts of violence, including murder. Currently incarcerated, Koch remains behind bars with a release date set for 2030. His case highlights the destructive impact of organized crime and the efforts undertaken to combat it, both locally and internationally. Number 8. Miguel Angel Félix Gallardo Miguel Angel Félix Gallardo, known as Godfather or Boss of Bosses, played a significant role in the rise of drug dealing in Mexico. He led the Guadalajara cartel, which brought vast amounts of drugs into the United States during the 1980s and united various cartels in Mexico. Gallardo's actions led to a surge in violence, culminating in the tragic murder of DEA agent Kiki Camarena, which sparked outrage in the United States. Despite his strategic thinking, Gallardo's ambition ultimately led to his downfall, drawing comparisons to ambitious historical figures like Julius Caesar. The impact of Gallardo's actions is still felt in Mexico today with a staggering execution rate. He envisioned Mexico as a hub for the trade, starting his criminal career as a police officer before forming the Guadalajara Cartel with associates Rafael Caro Quintero and Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo. Unlike typical drug lords, Gallardo aimed to present himself as a businessman and sought acceptance in higher society. He expanded his operations when Colombian traffickers turned to Mexico for smuggling routes into the U.S. due to increased law enforcement in Florida. Gallardo's cartel gained immense wealth thanks to his ability to negotiate and build a vast trafficking network. He even employed a young Joaquin El Chapo Guzman as his driver, impressing the powerful Colombian Cali cartel, which agreed to a significant partnership. However, Gallardo's empire faced a setback when DEA agent Camarena uncovered his activities, leading to a violent retaliation that resulted in Camarena's brutal torture and violence. This event sparked a massive crackdown on cartels by both Mexican and U.S. authorities. Despite his efforts to evade capture, Gallardo was eventually arrested in 1989. He received a 40-year sentence for his role in taking the life of Camarena. However, from behind bars, he tried to maintain control over his criminal network by orchestrating agreements among rival cartels. His imprisonment created a power vacuum leading to further violence and the rise of new leaders like El Chapo. The ensuing turf wars and conflicts between cartels escalated into what is now known as the Mexican Drug War, which continues to devastate the region. Gallardo's attempts to appeal his sentence failed, and he remains in prison. His ruthless actions caused immense harm to both the United States and Mexico, leaving a legacy of violence and chaos that continues to plague the region. Number 9. Nicky Barnes Nicky Barnes was born Leroy Nicholas Barnes in 1933 and passed away in 2012. He was a notable figure in New York City's underworld during the 1970s. Barnes rose to prominence by establishing The Council, a group of seven African-American individuals engaged in organized crime. Their primary enterprise revolved around controlling a significant portion of the drug trade in Harlem, New York City. Expanding their operations internationally, Barnes collaborated with the Italian-American Mafia 
until his arrest in 1977. Following his apprehension, he cooperated with authorities, leading to the dismantling of the council. At the time of his demise, he was living under a witness protection. Barnes's path towards a life of crime stemmed from a turbulent upbringing marked by an alcoholic father. Despite excelling academically, he departed from home early to escape his father's mistreatment, turning to drug dealing for financial support. This eventually led him into a cycle of addiction until he managed to break free during a stint in jail in his 20s. In 1965, Barnes found himself behind bars for minor offenses, where he crossed paths with influential underworld figures like Crazy Joe Gallo and Matthew Madonna, both entrenched in organized crime. Gallo, seeking to expand his operations into Harlem, imparted his knowledge to Barnes, ultimately culminating in the establishment of the council. Functioning akin to traditional mafia families, the council resolved disputes and managed distribution networks. By 1976, Barnes' illicit enterprise had spread across New York State, Pennsylvania, and Canada, with a structured hierarchy overseeing various tiers of distribution. To shield his ill-gotten gains, Barnes set up front companies, including car dealerships, which were eventually seized by law enforcement. His estimated net worth soared to over $50 million at the height of his criminal career. Despite facing multiple charges and arrests, Barnes earned the epithet Mr. Untouchable for skillfully evading legal repercussions. However, Barnes's downfall came swiftly in 1978, when he received a life sentence without parole for drug-related offenses. While incarcerated, he uncovered treachery within the council, prompting him to become a federal informant. His collaboration led to the indictment of over 100 individuals involved in illicit activities, including several members of the council. During his incarceration, Barnes pursued education, achieving notable milestones such as winning a national poetry contest and graduating with honors. Additionally, he took on the role of an English instructor for fellow inmates. Released from prison in 1998, Barnes lived out his remaining years under witness protection until his demise in 2012.